Scripture in the Tradition by Henri de Lubac. If you have ever wanted to read de Lubac, I would begin here. This work is actually not a book in the traditional sense conceived of as an argument by de Lubac from beginning to end. Rather, it is a compilation of chapters from some of his most influential works. So chapter one is actually an excerpt from History and Spirit, uh, 1950, and then the later chapters are excerpted from his three-volume work, Medieval Exegesis, written between 1959 and 1964. Medieval Exegesis can be somewhat overwhelming. I would still highly recommend it. One of the concerns de Lubac had was that if Scripture and the Tradition was published with these three chapters, that no one would actually return to medieval exegesis because it was overwhelming and this was the abridged format. So I would still want to point people towards medieval exegesis. However, this is a starting point. This would be an introduction to those ideas, and the ideas are highly influential. What is the relationship between scripture and the tradition? What are the ways that we would read scripture through the eyes of the tradition? What are the ways that scripture has in fact been informed by the tradition and we should not be separating these things. The resource Mont movement through the 1920s or 1960s, when several Catholic theologians, including Henri de Lubac, were actually returning to the sources. This is also called uh, Nouveau Theology, uh, the new theology, which is really a return to the old theology. And what a lot of these writers were, were doing was returning to the sources of Catholic thought. They were trying to revitalize our understanding of the patristic writers and the early exegesis in the church rather than the new historical criticism, the modern approach to reading scripture, and trying to understand a relationship between our previous traditional ways of reading scripture and the current ways of reading scripture, which perhaps needed to be revised and reconsidered. For example, one of the concerns that de Lubac had were these false separations between faith and reason, as well as these false separations between tradition and scripture. If you had tradition, you were a theologian who studied the, the theology and you didn't ever look at the scripture because that was the reign of the Bible scholars and um, those who were in hermeneutics, and they had their own little worlds. In the same way that uh, you would look at natural law and you would look at philosophy of the human person and the humanist had their own sphere, and that was separate from the world of faith. And these things were being divided in a false sense. Uh, of course, this is what uh, the moderns are somewhat famous for, right? These kind of false divisions that, that they were trying to understand and too many dichotomies, too many of either or system being set up. And de Lubac is speaking into that by returning to these early sources and saying, well, scripture wouldn't have happened without tradition. You don't have a Bible without the church recording the history of the church. So he was constantly looking even to the Old Testament as prefiguring the tradition, prefiguring the church. And then looking as well, the New Testament is being created. That is the tradition, creating the scriptures and canonizing the scriptures. And so this dichotomy between scripture and tradition doesn't even make sense because the scriptures wouldn't have existed. In the same way that um, we shouldn't separate biblical scholars from theologians as though your understanding of the Bible can objectify the text and take it apart and have its own system that doesn't bear on your understanding of God, your experience of God, your knowledge of who he is, your knowledge of the church and the ecclesiology, all of that should in fact be connected and not separated from one another. One way of looking at this, if we consider the um, critic Tolkien, most famous, of course, for his novel, The Lord of the Rings, or three novels, Lord of the Rings. If we look at how Tolkien tried to overcome this modernist interpretation of Beowulf, for instance. So here is a source that was passed down through the, the tradition and was considered an artifact of the tradition. So the scholars, the critics of Beowulf, considered the poem itself as an artifact of Old English, an artifact of history, 
Um, they did not consider it as a story, as a work of art, as an experience in which we could ask questions about power and justice and heroism and evil and goodness. They weren't looking to that work for those questions. They were studying it as an object rather than one in which the subject could engage. This would be a way of, of trying to see uh, De Lubach and Tolkien um, somewhat as contemporaries addressing these issues from different places. De Lubach's addressing them in terms of scripture, Tolkien's addressing them in terms of the Bible, of, of Beowulf. And so how can we learn from what De Lubach argues about hermeneutics and how to approach reading the scriptures and apply that then to how we should be reading other works of art like Beowulf. De Lubach's medieval exegesis, as I mentioned before, was rather large. So I'm going to just kind of summarize some of its main points for you. And hopefully this will help us understand scripture and the tradition. And as you're reading, give you some pegs to hang some of his great claims and ideas on. What De Lubach was after was not only just a practical way of reading scripture, but also just understanding the practice of reading. What should reading look like? And so he returns quite a bit to uh, the ascetic practices of the early patristics, as we've looked at with Origen and Basil and so forth, that they believed that you should have a certain way of living that also correlated with what you were reading. So charity, humility. And De Lubach felt like these were Christian practices that also prepared you for being able to engage the text. He also considered the three-prong tension that we've looked at in relationship between the text itself, the author, and the reader. And he's always trying to understand how the interpretation of the text is also a revelation of who the reader is being able to see, is this text going to be lived out? In what ways is this text lived? Um, what is the author's intention? What is God saying in the way that he writes the history of the Old Testament in ways that he sets up the, the New Testament to come when it does? To see these things as a living conversation in which we are currently also participating in the tradition, and thus we're participating in this process of interpretation, and it, it's not finished, it's not completed. Um, and that's why he wanted to always consider that truth is not being passed down like um, a product in and of itself, just a block you hand to the next person, but that these things are an alive and dynamic process. And therefore, there's this, um, this constant growth and connection between tradition and scripture, not a static one in, in which we just kind of hand, hand on something finalized to the next generation. Lastly, and this might seem obvious to us now, so we have to put ourselves into De Lubach's shoes. Why is it that he's drawn on these early patristic and medieval writers in order to bring this into conversation with the church now? But the way that the church was, or the way that theologians were looking at scripture, or Bible scholars were looking at scripture, was an object. Uh, they were they were diving into it not to be changed, not to be transformed, but to analyze. Um, it was very much in vogue, the historical critical perspective, and you don't engage the text. You are not trying to meet Christ there. There was no sense of the spiritual reading of the text or that the text would make any demands on who you were and how you lived. And all of that might seem obvious to us now, having read some of these early patristic and medieval writers, but at the time that De Lubach is writing, that was not the consideration. And so he is trying to emphasize that the reader is coming to the text, participating in the text, and potentially meeting Christ in the text. The four senses, I want to highlight the ways in which we can really start to imagine these four senses apart from reading scripture. I believe that De Lubach's analysis of the four senses is just one of the, the strongest tools we have for being able to read any text. When he talks about the literal, he's primarily talking about the historical. He's trying to agree with those modern writers who are looking at the, the history and the context of the text, what is happening, what is the story being told in the Old Testament. But I also believe that we should hold on to Augustine's way of understanding the literal as ad literam, like to the word, what is it meaning? 
um, what are the words, Gregory of the Great, for example, on Ezekiel, trying to understand what he sees in the words and how um, potential, there's a spiritual poten potency there in the words themselves. And then de Lubac is dividing the typological and allegorical from the spiritual sense. And he looks different in this way from the patristic and medi medieval writers who saw the allegorical and typological, right, the figure of Christ as the spiritual experience of the text. And so I want to differentiate what uh, de Lubac's doing here. For him, the allegory is the Christ reference. So in what ways can we use a Christological lens to view the Old Testament and the New Testament? In what ways is the revelation of Christ changing all of our previous understanding of Old Testament and pagan literature, but also changing anything that comes after and our understanding of uh, what's true or not from the moments of Christ's revelation. So he sees that Kairos, that moment in history, as completely changing our way of reading. And thus, we are looking for this, um, these allegories, these figures of Christ in all of our literature. Let me jump to tropological, and then I will show you how anagogical fits with this earlier understanding of allegorical. Thus, it becomes imperative for the reader to analyze his or her own life afterwards. What is the point of seeing Christ in the text if Christ then does not live in you after the text? And he's getting this from Origen, from Jerome, from those writers who would meet Christ in the text and then make different changes in their lives, make different decisions, from that reading. If this is true about the world, how then now shall I live? And that's what he wants us to keep returning to, is to not end with an objective study of the text, but to end with a changed life. And so the Lectio Divina, he's going to draw on as uh, the final fulfillment, worship, the Eucharist, are ways of practicing the tradition and continuing the tradition after reading scripture becomes very important. Finally, the spiritual or the eschatological, he emphasizes this so much. He is not only speaking about the allegorical. He is not only speaking about the ways in which there are figures and symbols that we want to pay attention to, which he does believe are important, but also what ways are, is there spiritual import or meaning beyond what the text could have been pointing to in and of itself? For instance, when we look at Isaiah, the suffering servant, so Isaiah is pointing something historical at his moment in time. His words then also speak truthfully to Christ allegorically who comes, then tropologically, morally. Um, what does it mean to follow a, a God who is suffering? And then finally, finally, eschatologically, how can we view suffering through this lens? What is the spiritual import and reality that changes our ways of viewing suffering to see it through the lens of Isaiah? How do we take Isaiah, suffering servant, as a lens outward onto everything around us, onto relevant contemporary headlines, onto um, texts, you know, Faulkner's short stories, or um, Martin Luther King uses these images in his speeches, what are the ways that we we take the biblical understanding of these realities and point it outwards? And that's what he's trying to get at with the spiritual or eschatological reading. So I hope that helps as you try to navigate through scripture and the tradition and hopefully give you some pegs to hang some of these great ideas on. Um, I welcome questions. I welcome input. And again, I think this is a phenomenal text. I hope you read it slowly and I hope you read it closely and I hope you read it well.